Good morning, councillors, and uh, to our staff, good morning. Uh, welcome to those uh, watching via live streaming uh, for this uh, finance and budget special meeting. And I want to, uh, on behalf of council, acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather today in the Sunshine Coast local government area, that they are the Kabi Kabi peoples of the coastal plains and northern hinterland and the Jinnaburra people of the southern hinterland. Uh, and uh, on your behalf, I'd like to pay our respects to their elders past, present, uh, and indeed to all Indigenous people. We have no apologies for today's meeting. Councillor Babarowski has advised that he'll be 10 minutes late. Um, Councillors, I'd also like to draw to your attention that on May 21, 2018, amendments to the Local Government Act 2009 came into force. These amendments include the new Division 5A, which provides new legislative arrangements for dealing with councillors' personal interests in local government matters. Uh, these arrangements will apply to how we manage such matters at today's meeting. So in the event that there is any personal interest or perceived conflict or conflict of interest, please raise that prior to the matter being dealt with. Um, I would ask for somebody to move a suspension of standing orders to allow uh, live streaming uh, in the interests of the safety and health of the community. The Local Government Regulation 2012 has recently been amended in relation to the public attendance at council meetings. This is to enable councillors to comply with national public health directions related to COVID-19. Councillor Natoli has moved. Councillor Johnston has seconded. All those in favour? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> today's reports commence with item 4.1, which is the budget review for 2920. And I'll call on Michael Costello and I Isaac Pickerskill to give us a presentation. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, morning, all. I'm just going to run through presentation for Budget Review 3, uh, a lot of information we have previously covered uh, in, uh, in workshops, or a particular workshop for Budget Review 3. Let me just get the preso up. Okay, thank you. So the Budget Review, uh, Section 170 of Local Government Regulations allows Council to amend its budget throughout the financial year. Uh, due to the COVID-19 impacts, this um, Budget Review uh, is late uh, by um, perhaps a, a couple of months, but again, it's a requirement of the local government regulations. So part of included in the adoption of this report will be um, financial statements for our income and expenses, balance sheet, changes in equity cash flow, and additional um, measures of financial sustainability, 10-year capital program, and also our debt policy. The budget principles adopted by Council at the commencement of the financial year uh, note the service levels to align with the corporate plan, maintain our cash levels, maintain or decrease our debt levels for core, and the operational result to be equal or greater than the, the debt redemption, plus a contribution to new capex and non-operational levy funding. Uh, the COVID-19 financial impacts uh, have been tracked to reflect the end of year operation. There have been some adjustments that have occurred in the last couple of weeks which are not included in this review due to the nature, uh, the changing nature of the COVID-19. Um, and any adjustments to the capital works program have been required as well. So they're included in the, in the budget review. So just a snapshot of the budget review. Uh, the major items I'll touch on is the operating result. Our current budget operating result of $20 million will reduce to $584,000 as a result of COVID-19 and a couple of other adjustments. And just the, lastly, the, the closing cash. So our closing cash figure will reduce by just under $21 million to $229 million. So the financial impacts for COVID-19, uh, business support package of around about $2.2 million, which encompass waiver of fees and charges, waiver of community and commercial leases, no interest has been applied on overdue rates, a reduction in is issuing of regulated parking infringements, parking metres were turned off in Batinia and Caloundra CBD, and access to professional advice provided for small to medium businesses. 
on, a, on the financial side, on a corporate level, we've had a reduction in revenue for the Sunshine Coast Airport for our royalties and refunds of, of commercial waste cleansing charges. The holiday parks have been the major impact of, our, uh, of the COVID-19 and the closure of the holiday parks has resulted in foregone revenue. Uh, bottom line impact, approximately 2.9 million. Council facilities have loss of revenue as well of the tune of about a million dollars. We brought forward some maintenance from future years uh, to this year while the venues have been closed. And we've had an acceleration of capital works program from, uh, from future years into this year whilst the various um, facilities were closed. So aquatic centres, Millwell Road Community Centre, Kings Beach Ocean Pool, Clounder Indoor Stadium and, and the Holiday Parks. There are also a few other adjustments included in, in this review. Uh, reduced interest on investments, which has been an ongoing theme throughout budget reviews throughout the year. Uh, the Reserve Bank has reduced the cash rate by 75 basis points throughout the year. Uh, this has resulted in a reduction in interest available for investments, and the reduction in total across the year has been $4 million. Uh, the Reserve's cash rate at the moment is 0.25 per cent. Uh, the bushfires, uh, we've received $1.2 million from federal government uh, to assist in the recovery of the bushfires from earlier this year, and a program of works was endorsed by Council in March of this year and will be delivered over the next two financial years. Region shaping projects, there's been a deferral of land sales in the Maroochydore City Centre. Uh, there's a contract for sale of 5.5 million, but due to a, a change in accounting standards, recognition of that revenue will not occur until next financial year. And the net impact for 1920 is, 19, uh, is sorry, $9 million. And the officer of recommendation, as is Mr Mayor. Seventy of the local government regulation 2012 allows council to amend its budget by resolution at any time before the end of the financial year. And this year has been a very challenging year uh, with COVID-19 and the impacts it has. The result of the budget review will decrease the 2019-20 operating result by 19.5 million, down to 584,000. Now, the amendments to this budget review will decrease the 1920 forecast closing cash balance by $20.7 million. And we're doing this for our community. The reduction in Council's operating result is largely attributable to the impacts of COVID-19 restrictions, with a financial impact of $8 million for the 2019-20 year. As has been covered, these cover our business support package for our community corporate finance with the drop in interest rates, the closure of council facilities like our holiday parks and aquatic centres, etc. Now, through the COVID-19 control group, council has endorsed 2.2 million in initiatives to assist business and residents during this pandemic. They include the waiver of the following fees and charges, footpath, indoor dining and trading fees, food licensing fees, commercial low-use, commercial high-use permits, commercial leases, Calandra Aerodrome commercial leases, community leases, interest on rates in arrears to help our residents in this struggling time, and access to professional advice for small and medium businesses. Business signage to support business and have to alter their service arrangements. Now, Mr Mayor, in response to this, we have accelerated our capital works program through the COVID-19 control group for capital projects in 1920. The majority of these projects are expected to be completed in the 2021 financial year, and that's to support our community and our businesses. The reduced uh, interest on investments, as I stated before, the cash rate the Reserve Bank of Australia has dropped it to uh, 0.25. It's reduced by 75 basis points by October 2019. This reduction has uh, cost us around $4 million in foregone revenue. So we're taking all these impacts on and we're still delivering for our community. Mr Mayor, I hope we have a better year next year with the, pandem with the pandemic and hope we come out of this qu quicker than expected. But I do, would like to have the cautionary note there. This is our 
Budget Review 3, but I note that our um, operating result may be further impacted during the 2021 year. To what degree that is, is yet to be seen, but I'm sure we can handle it. But I think the community can have confidence that this council is using its resources to its ability to deliver and help the residents and the businesses of this community. And uh, this budget review clearly shows that. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Hungerford. Councillor Natali. As Councillor Hungerford mentioned, this year we've taken a massive hit in terms of COVID-19 in terms of the budget. Just a question to you, um, Michael. Um, I notice in the, on page 15, the statement of income and expenditure, the two biggest operating expenses are both employee costs and materials and services. Now, apart from the year 2021, the years beyond that, especially employment, employee costs, we've got increases of three and a half and then subsequent years of 3% increases. And then with the materials and services, we have increases uh, in 2021 of 5%, and then it goes from 3%, 45 6 and, a half, and then the plateaus. I mean, in terms of our organisation in being able to rein in some of these expenses so that we can tighten our belt, I mean, what is the plan to go ahead rather than keep building in these factors that seem to be beyond inflationary and beyond our ability to be able to uh, increase our rates beyond that, that amount? But these figures that we have here are quite substantial when you consider that they're our two biggest uh, expenses in terms of our operating expenses. Could you just give me some indication? I've got some follow-up questions as well. Uh, three, Mr Mayor. Uh, the, the nature of having this budget review so late as a result of the COVID-19, uh, what you see in front of a few is the 19-20 year projected out in our long-term model. Uh, with the budget uh, adoption or the budget meeting in the 25th of June, uh, those figures will change quite substantially. So uh, the, the nature of this review is that it's reflecting 19, 20 year and then pushed out based on uh, certain parameters. Those parameters have been discussed during the, uh, the budget development for next financial year and the out years and the 25th of June when the budget adoption, those figures will, will change um, somewhat, particularly for the operating expenses in the out years. It's just more so a timing nature, Councillor. Okay, thank you. And a follow-up question. On page 20, we have the total corporate major project capitals program. Um, why don't we reflect in the financial documents the actual income attached to those individual projects? Because we talk about, um, under the strategic policy, we talk about on page 22 that borrowings for infrastructure that provides a return on assets will take priority over borrowings for other assets. And I would imagine that there'd have to be an acceptable return on, on assets. But why wouldn't we be trying to reflect whether we're actually succeeding in meeting those targets and where we've got capital outlay, we've got borrowings, we've got money that goes to these projects, but nowhere can I see the return that we get on these investments reflected in these, in these financial statements. Uh, three, Mr Mayor, we have got the debt policy for next financial year coming up in a, in, a, in a further report, but just technically we still need to put forward this year's debt policy as a part of a budget review. Uh, the, 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 your question, the, the numbers are within, uh, when we look at our total operating result, uh, the returns that we're having, so for the, uh, if we take the airport for example, in a cash basis, they're reflected in the long term financial model on a cash side in, in the year 2022. Uh, where we'll see $305 million from that particular investment, which is heavily debt funded for the airport, where we'll see the, the benefit of around about $31 million, which will, is, is reflected in these financial statements. But again, the, uh, the, due to the um, timing of, of this budget review being probably two months late, um, it's, it's mixed up a little bit in our budget development for next financial year. But the return on the invest in those particular investments, the larger investments, is included in the long-term uh, forecasts. I, I suppose in terms of the visibility, um, what I'm trying to get at is that council must make a decision to borrow the money based on an expected return on investment. And somewhere in these documents, we should be able to uh, identify what the, that investment is, what was our anticipated uh, return on investment, 
and whether we're actually tracking along the path of, of meeting that, that return of investment. And if it isn't, it can clearly then be shown in a table where we can see what our investments are, what our borrowings are, and see what our return on investments are, and to see whether we're meeting those targets. And I would, I would hope that our documents going forward from here can actually have a table that actually makes it that clear and that transparent in terms of what uh, the whole process has been from start to finish. Uh, three, Mr Mayor. Technically, in relation to the financial statements that, that we produce for a budget review is, is what's in front of you. When you see on the budget adoption and our previous eight budgets or nine budgets, uh, we include all of our region shaping projects. So if you look at the, um, the financial statements that we have from our original budget for this year and, and more so when we look at our um, uh, future year, when the budget adoption on the 25th of June, that will include the region shaping projects. So in the, you see financial statements for Maroochydore City Centre, for the, air, uh, the um, Sunshine Coast Airport runway project and, and for the cable. Uh, the long-term financial statements are included in our budget, in our budget documentation for those three region shaping projects. Yeah. Nice, clear and transparent. Any further speakers? <clears throat> Go to Councillor Hungerford to close. For, for quarter three, and uh, it's all clearly there. And um, I'm very, very confident that we are on track. We've just got to get through this COVID-19 and the impacts there. $8 million to the 30th of June this year, projected 17 million um, for, for the next financial year, but we don't know whether there's going to be more than that yet. It depends on how we come through the year. But we need to focus on those in each quarter going through. We're very well placed, Mr Mayor, because of past financial management. We do have um, considerable headwinds here and we need to be focused all the way through, but this is a very positive outlay of how we've handled our, our finances to date. And I put this forward to you, councillors, and I support the quarter three um, recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Hungerford. We'll put the motion to the vote. All those in favour? That's carried unanimously. Thank you, councillors. We'll move to item 4.2, which is the uh, Investment Policy 2021. And again, I invite Michael Costello and uh, Janine, who's here with us as well, to give us a presentation. Thank you, Michael. These next three reports, because they're more of a technical nature. Uh, so the investment policy for the next financial year, for 2021, it's a legislative requirement under local government regulations. Uh, our investments are limited by the Statutory Body Financial Arrangements Act. Uh, we are a Category 2 investor, which means that uh, we can only invest in Australian dollars. Our term cannot be greater than three years, and uh, we cannot invest in derivatives. Uh, the philosophy of this investment policy is uh, priority is given to the pres preservation of capital investment over investment returns, and we minimise exposure to credit risk, interest rate risk, and foreign exchange risk. Now, that does result in uh, a, re a reduced return on income, but we have a capital guaranteed, and I'm very proud to say that, particularly over the, over the COVID-19 and previously in the GFC, that uh, not one cent of Council's capital has been reduced as a result of, the, of this investment um, adherence to the investment policy. Uh, there has been one uh, minor change to the investment policy, and that relates to the... Um, uh, the counterparty limits for an A2 financial institution, and that's been reduced by 5% because there have been some financial institutions that have been downgraded as a result of COVID-19, and this just gives us a little bit more scope uh, to uh, increase our interest returns. And the recommendation is in front of you. Um, Thank Mr. you. Matt. Thank you, Michael. We'll, we'll vote on each of these as we go through. Um, someone happy to move the... Uh, Officer recommendation for the investment policy. Councillor Hungerford, thank you. Seconded, Councillor Babarowski. You want to speak to the report, Councillor? Just hit your mic there, Ted, please. I'm leaving it on now. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, the Local Government Regulation 2012, Section 191, requires councils to prepare an investment policy annually. The investment policy sets the boundaries for investment, includes the overall philosophy and strategy for investment of surplus funds. And they're constrained this year because of COVID-19. Along with detailed guidelines and procedures for officers in the application of the policy. The only change to the existing policy is to slightly increase the counterparty limit in A2, financial institutions, by 5%, as some of Council's financial institutions have been downgraded due to the impacts of COVID-19. It's very important, Mr Mayor, that the um, guideline includes a list of prohibited investments that require Treasurer approval, including derivative-based investments, non-Australian dollars, and maturity maximum greater than three years. We do not do any of those. We're being very prudent and very sound with our investment policy. Um, and as can be seen on page 26 on the ta uh, table of, of the funds and the percentage in there, that is a very prudent um, and, and, and safe investment in these uncertain times. And I think the community can be assured that we are doing things prudently all the way through. Um, if you had have gone into derivatives and things being a share market investor myself, um, I'm glad we didn't go down that path because we would have been substantial losses with the current turmoil in the share market. And um, I, I take it to our, our finance people um, that they, they know they, they view this on a weekly, monthly basis. And I've looked at those and they, they are being very cautious and very prudent with those funds. Thank you, Councillor Hungerford. Any further speakers? Don't need to close, Councillor. We'll put the motion to the vote. All those in favour? It's carried unanimously. Thank you, Councillors. We go to item 4.3, is the debt policy for 2021. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, once again, I'll speak to this policy because it's a, uh, a requirement of the local government regulations. Uh, just a couple of points to note that the proposed borrowings and associated financial costs are included in the budget for next financial year. Uh, new loans are generally drawn down um, at the end of the financial year to minimise interest for that particular year. Uh, the Council's borrowings are, are governed by, as I said, the statutory body's Financial Arrangements Act, similar with the investments, and the debt policy provides clear guidelines for our loan raising requiring an assessment of the impact of the borrowing decision on Council's long-term financial sustainability. And there have been no changes to the debt policy of the existing year, Mr Mayor. Great. Uh, again, someone to move the officer recommendation? Councillor Hungerford, a seconder. Councillor Natoli, would you like to speak to the motion, Councillor? Um, section 169.2c of the Local Government Regulation 2012 requires Councillor to include the budget a revenue policy. Now, our revenue policy under section 193 of the Local Government Act includes levy, levying rates and charges, granting concessions for rates and charges, recovering overdue rates and charges, and cost recovery methods. Um, the, re the revenue policy has been reviewed and updated to include concessions. Council may grant in accordance with section 121C of the Local Government Regulation 2012 if the payment of rates or charges will cause hardship to the landowner. And that's, I think, this one here, the most substantial one we've got there, is not charging the interest on people endeavouring to pay their rates as long as they enter with us in a, in a, in a, a payment program. And that's to help our residents through the COVID-19. I think that's been a very important one for Council to look at this year. Um, but again, it's very sound. Uh, the revenue policy there, we're really trying to be firm and fa fair with everything, fair and, and reasonable with what we're doing there in these tough times. And um, councillors, I certainly hope that um, next year we're in a lot better position than we are this year to, to be able to move forward. And I'll put this to you. Thank you, Any further speakers? Councillor Natale. Sorry for harping again on that, that very issue about borrowing for infrastructure that provides the opportunity for a return on assets. Uh, and it says it will take priority over borrowings for other assets. When we undertake this process, uh, Michael, what is the expected rate of return that is acceptable for us to actually um, go ahead 
with borrowing? Do we develop that? Do we have a policy or resolution of council to ensure that there is a revenue stream if we need to establish that before we go down that path? So just talk me through that process so that I understand whether we actually establish a rate of return that's acceptable to borrow and do we actually need resolutions in place to make sure that that re revenue requires a council resolution or policy in place before we make that decision needs to be in place before we do that? Uh, three, Mr Mayor. Uh, there are various hurdle rates that, that differ uh, depending on the investment uh, that, that um, we'll be undertaking. Uh, if we take the Maroochydore City Centre, for example, that's a 25-year project. Uh, the uh, philosophy around that was a, a break-even in that there, there was borrowings and those borrowings need to be repaid. There's $430 million of expenditure with $430 million of revenue over that period of time. Uh, with $300 million of, of community assets coming back. So in that, in that particular instance, it was a, a break-even, but, but again, there's $300 million of community assets. Uh, with the, uh, the Sunshine Coast Airport expansion, uh, which is where most of our debt is, is sitting at present, uh, we're planning on borrowings for the airport of another $37 million included in this debt policy uh, for next year. Uh, the evaluation of, of the, all of the airport um, uh, runway process along with the airport uh, business yields a $31 million uh, benefit to Council in June of 2022 when Palisade paid $305 million. So I guess in answer to your question, Councillor, there, there's various hurdle rates specific for a particular project and those outcomes for a particular project may be community focused, hence the Maroochydore City Centre where there's $300 million of community assets that, that um, come back to Council or in relation to the, uh, to the airport runway business, uh, there's a cash uh, return of, of $31 million proposed for June of 2022. Now, if we look at other, other projects, if we say the Brisbane Road car park, for example, which is, will have about $24 million of debt um, of, of $15 million will be borrowed in next financial year, included in this debt policy. Uh, there are um, long-term models that are put in place, place in relation to uh, that asset and the returns and the hurdle rates for those assets. But once again, those hurdle rates differ dependent on the particular asset that we're investing in. Just a follow-up. You mentioned the Brisbane Road car park, and that's the question I want to lead to in terms of a council policy or position in terms of the rate of return. At this stage, if we go into um, reports that follow up in regards to the new bus business cases in terms of um, uh, uh, competitive neutrality and whether we actually establish a new business, um, we talk about whether council still will go down the path of charging for, for car parking. So it hasn't actually made a resolution or determination that an income source will come yet we've triggered the borrowings for this particular project. I'm trying to get my head around understanding at what point um, does it qualify to be part of a borrowing outside of our core operations so that it's meant to have an income source and, and yet we haven't got an established position in terms of determining whether council is still at this part will go down that path and introduce paid car parking. So I ask that question, I suppose, trying to understand what drives our decisions to make an investment when we don't actually have uh, a secured source of income at this stage. Uh, three, Mr Mayor, the, the, the paid parking philosophy, there is a council resolution in relation to paid parking, but again, I'm, I'm uh, really realistic to know that there's further work that needs to be done there. Uh, so perhaps, Councillor, if there's further information on that, we might take that, uh, I'll take that on notice and, and provide that at a later date, specifically to the analysis around the Brisbane Road car park. Any further speakers? <clears throat> Councillor Law? Through you, Mr May. Uh, I just have a question, if I may. Uh, we, we were told that the um, investment rates have reduced to some extremely low levels. Does the debt policy give us uh, enough flexibility and movement to be able to look at taking advantage of lower borrowing rates on our existing um, arrangements at the moment without increasing any risk whatsoever? Uh, 
through you, Mr. Mayor, um, our, our overall debt is made up of a, a tranche of number of, in, of, um, uh, of loans. So each of those loans are of a fixed term nature. Uh, for example, we just borrowed $27 million last week for the uh, Sunshine Coast Airport runway. That was at 0.98 per cent. That was a shorter term. Uh, in relation to our existing debt, uh, to make a change to our existing debt, uh, which we have um, uh, looked at in the past with our bankers QTC, uh, there, is, there will be an adjustment. So if we look at our current uh, arrangements that we have for, uh, if we say, the, uh, the, the majority of our debt, um, the adjustments for the, for the um, if we were to rearrange that debt and then make a, a new payment term from now with a lower interest rate, there would be a market value adjustment with that. Similar to what you would do if you had a, a fixed loan for a housing loan, uh, you would then have to make a payment to the bank for their loss of interest over the term remaining for that loan. So again, in the complexities of our, our suite of, um, of debt that we have, which is made up of a number of loans over a period of time, some three years, mostly 12 years, some 20 years, uh, if we were to make uh, a change to that with our bankers right now, there would be a substantial market value adjustment due to this falling nature of the interest rates. Uh, there's a converse relationship, or inverse relationship, sorry, in relation to falling interest rates. The lower the interest rates fall, the higher the market value adjustment. At the moment, we, we'd be looking at around about roughly $20 million if we were to renegotiate our loans. We would need to pay our bankers around about $20 million. Uh, as a market value adjustment. But in, in saying that, we are continuing negotiations with uh, Queensland Treasury Corp about specifics ma making up all of our debt. But, uh, Councillor, we are looking all the time in relation to how we can uh, maximise uh, the, the impact of the lower interest regime that we have now. No further speakers. Vote to close, Councillor. In a nutshell, this is a very prudent and fair revenue policy as we go into the future, and I, I commend this to the, to, the, to the meeting and for ask for your support. Thank you, Councillor. That's debt, the debt policy. Okay, all those in favour? That's carried unanimously. Thank you, Councillors. Move to item 4.4, .4, which is the revenue policy. Mr Costello, thank you. To me. Uh, so once again, a technical requirement as per the local government regulations. Uh, the revenue policy is in accordance with section 193 of the local government regulations and sets out some principles, so key principles for the levying of rates and charges, for the granting of concessions for rates and charges, for the recovery of overdue rates and charges and for our cost recovery methods. Uh, there have been no changes to the existing uh, revenue policy, Mr Mayor. I just will note a couple of impacts in relation to the COVID-19 in, in that we have um, not, uh, we've actively worked with ratepayers in, in relation to their outstanding rates when, when COVID hit in around about March. Uh, we've got uh, additional payment plans of around about 4% of our properties, around about 6,000 properties have got payment plans um, to uh, uh, pay off their debt over a longer period of time than we normally would have. We would have preferred that that debt would have been paid off by 30 June this year, but that's been extended in relation to the COVID-19. As we've heard previously in the budget review, Budget Review 3, uh, there is no interest that is being charged on, on overdue rates. Um, and that has resulted in an increase to our, our overdue rates. But again, we're not chasing those, money, the, those monies in relation to supporting our community during the COVID-19. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr Costello, someone to move? Councillor Cox, thank you. Can I have a seconder? Councillor Hungerford, thank you. Would you like to open, Councillor Cox? Okay. Anybody wish to speak to the motion? Okay. No need to close. Put the motion to the vote. All those in favour? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. Uh, Mr Costello, move on to item 4.5, the Register of General Cost Recovery Fees and Commercial Charges. Yes. Councillor O'Pray. Yes. On Thursday, the 11th of June, 2020, uh, I, Jason O'Pray, propose to inform the Council that I have a conflict of interest in relation to Agenda Item 4.5, the Register of General Costs and Commercial Charges. 
as I have a close personal friendship with Grant Belcher, who is the current LEC of a number of aquatic centres across the Sunshine Coast and supported my 2012 election campaign with $2,000. Mr Mayor, in relation to the personal interest to set out above in accordance with S175E2 and for my own consistency, I intend to leave the meeting chamber and set aside for any public for the duration of the discussion, debate and vote on the item. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Councillor O'Prey. <clears throat> OK, we'll go to the presentation. Thank you, Mr Costello. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Let's have a presentation I'll run through. Um, similar to uh, talked about with Budget Review 3, councillors, we have had a previous workshop on, on the fees and charges for next financial year. So of the fees and charges, we have cost recovery fees uh, covered under Section 97 of the Local Government Act. Uh, those fees relate to recording of a, examples, recording of a change of ownership, uh, providing information kept under the Local Government Act, uh, seizing property or animals and the performance of any other responsibilities under the Local Government Act. These fees are required to be set at equal or less than the cost of providing that service. We also have charges uh, which are commercial in nature uh, and, and they're covered by Section 263 of, of the Local Government Act. For next year we have a budget parameter of an increase of 2%. Uh, the general cost recovery fees and commercial fees for next year are forecast revenue of $38.5 million. Of, of those fees, there's just over 1,200 of them, covering most areas of council. There's 218 cost recovery fees and 994 uh, commercial fees. Some of the highlights in relation to the fees and charges is that the parameters within uh, 2 per cent. Uh, there's been a removal of glamping fees within the holiday parks, which were introduced during this year. Uh, there's a bit refactoring of fees for the Sunshine Coast Stadium to allow for the new lighting. Uh, removal of unused fees uh, for the venue 114 and the state government has deferred an increase to the waste levy for six months until January 21. Uh, commercial waste fees have been incorporated into this adjustment. So the, the commercial waste uh, for the waste levy is $75 a tonne this year. It was proposed to go to $80, $80 a tonne in 1 July. That has been deferred until January of next year and once again Mr Mayor that's been reflected in the fees and charges. And we have the recommendation in front of you. Thank you, Mr Costello. Someone move. Councillor Hungerford. Seconder. Councillor Babarowski. Thank you. Please open, Councillor. Thank you, Mr Mayor. As we all know, cost recovery fees are covered under Section 97 of the Local Government Act 2009 and are required to be set equal or less than the cost of providing the service. They're the parameters we have. Now, where user charges do not meet the cost of providing the service, a subsidy from general rates will be required, which may risk the achievement of a balanced operating result. So, Mr Mayor, the Fees and Charges Workshop was held with councillors to present the Register of General Cost Recovery Fees and Commercial Charges for 2020-2021. The workshop focused on the added and deleted fees fees with variations from 2% budget fee increase parameter and fee decreases. Now the general cost recovery fees and commercial charges revenue for 2020-21 is expected to be approximately 38.5 million. But I will note that this um, estimation may be further impacted by COVID-19 as we go through the 2021 20, year. Hopefully not, not as uh, much as we've been, been impacted so far. But councillors, uh, this has been looked at and it's a, it's a, a very fair and reasonable um, cost recovery fee structure and I commend it to you to support this today. Thank you, Councillor Hungerford. Any other speakers to the motion? You don't need to close, Councillor. No. We'll put the motion to the vote. All those in favour? <clears throat> That's carried unanimously. Thank you. Would someone retrieve Councillor O'Prey, please? <clears throat> and we're going to move on to the next item, which is item 4.6, the Development Services Register for Cost Recovery Fees and Commercial Charges. I'm going to invite Patricia Jensen to give us a presentation. Thank you. I'll be a moment. <clears throat> yes, no, that's fine. I understand.
Thank you, Patricia. Um, good morning, Mayor and Councillors. Um, today I'm presenting the proposed development uh, services fees and charges register for 2020-21. Um, to assist with any questions you may have, I also have Alex Farrell here, who's in the, um, um, on the side here, who's a senior uh, business operations officer in the branch. Um, the first slide here is looking at the development outlook um, that we have for the next financial year. Um, it's important to note that uh, there are a number of factors that can impact on the forecasting of development services revenue, um, such as the broader economic conditions and the underlying demand for development stock, confidence in the local development market, complexity and scale of development proposals in development applications. Um, development activity has been stable in 1920. However, at this time, it is challenging to determine the anticipated development activity for 2021 due to the economic uncertainty resulting from the current COVID-19 event. Based on the pricing parameters set in the Council's budget guidelines and taking into consideration the revenue achieved for previous years, the forecasted revenue for the anticip is anticipated to be approximately 18 million for next year. The format and structure of our fees and charges register for the next financial year has been significantly changed due to combining the two previous registers, Register for Planning, Engineering and Environment Assessment, and Register for Building and Plumbing Services into one register for development services. Consolidating to one register has enabled the, the removal of duplicated sections that have been included in both registers as well as being able to make improvements and changes to ensure consistent fees, terminology and reference throughout the register. The new format and structure, structure also closely aligns with Council's register of uh, general cost recovery to ensure a consistent customer experience, as well as ensuring we represent it as one Council. The 2021 register can be found in Appendix A to the report. It should be noted that in this fee document, sections 15 and 16 for the, uh, are governed by state policy and have not been released to date. These fees will be updated in the register prior to the release on the 1st July 2020. To support this report, we have provided the following um, additional attachments, which have been used to assist in updating the fees for the branch. Attachment one is the comparison of fees compared with this financial year to the proposed fees for 2021. Attachment two is the Urban Development Institute of Australia Queensland Research Foundation benchmark report comparing Sunshine Coast Council fees against some main categories of 15 other SEQ councils. Attachment three is a targeted benchmark carried out by council of some specific fee categories that have been analysed to determine to be changed. All the fees align with Council's budget guidelines, except for the updated change fees outlined on this slide and some new fees that we've outlined on the next slide. Uh, let's first look at the updated changed existing fees in the register, which are predominantly a reduction of fees and the simplification of processes, wording and format. Section 2.2.2 of uh, detailed pre-lodgements on on-site on meet, meetings, this fee is being reduced to $965 per hour and includes travel time to attend the on-site meeting. Section 3, dwelling house and dual occupancy. This is a newly formatted section where we have amalgamated the existing fees under a new heading for ease of use of our customers and to ensure consistency. Section 4.2.3, bar. This fee is being changed to align with other SEQ Council fees, um, and particularly looking at the benchmarking exercise that we did. Section 4.3.3, .3, High Impact Industry, and Section 4.3.7, Technical uh, Research and Technical Industry. The capping per square metre has changed from 6,000 square metres to 3,000 square metres for consistency and alignment with other industry e uses. Section 7.1.2 and 7.2.2, .2, Operational Works Construction. The fee for additional prescribed council inspe inspections has reduced from $715 to $400 per inspection to ensure, ensure consistency with fees, um, other fees for inspections. 
Section 10.3 and 10.4, changing a development approval, a number of changes have been made to the fees associated with a minor change request um, to ensure that it aligns with complexity. Section 13.1.10 and 13.1.11, plumbing record searches, the fees and searches have been changed to domestic and commercial with $80 and $250 respectively. Section 14.1.5, 14.1.18 for infrastructure agreements and external expert consultants. The fees and wordings have been changed to include legal costs, particularly those associated with assessment, review, finalisation of infrastructure agreements. New fees. Um, there are six new fees that we have proposed in the register. Um, 10.2 is minor change for operational works. Previously, there wasn't a defined fee for operational works for minor changes. Um, this will now help with the industry with um, defining what they are. Um, the fee will be a maximum of four plan changes and one condition fee up to $945. 11.2.3 is the transfer of assessment manager functions. Um, the existing fee has been changed to create two separate fees for domestic commercial. 11.7.5 and 11.7.6. Both of these fees have been introduced in the register to ensure that we actually are getting cost recovery for the work that we are undertaking and to also make sure we are assessing the work that's undertaken in accordance with the Queensland Development Code. 12.5.9 is temporary building work. This is to ensure that where temporary structures are, are, are being built that we actually are getting them lodged within council to see, make sure that we are seeing the provision of appropriate drainage and plumbing. Section 14.1.15 is preparation of infrastructure agreements. Um, as mentioned on the previous slide, we've now um, introduced this new fee also to um, look at price and application to ensure we actually are receiving co cost recovery for major infrastructure agreements that are or deeds of variation. Um, another fee that we thought we should mention in particular is our building certification fees. Um, there's been a lot of activity in the building certification industry over the last few years. Um, the fee for building applications has changed in section 11.1.1 to uh, price on application. So since mid-2018, there has been a significant tightening of the professional indemnity, or PI, as is known, insurance market increased difficulty in obtaining uh, exclusive free PI insurance by building industry professions, particularly building certifiers. This has occurred against the backdrop of significant events, such as the event of the Grenfell fire towers in 2017. This PI insurance problem is a result of years of underpricing of Australian PI market, claims increasing and becoming substantially higher than premiums, and a rebalance of the Australian PI insurance market as a part of the global shift. In turn, this has had an effect on the availability and affordability of compliant PI insurance across Australia. The Building Act includes provisions that allows building certification functions for building work applications to be carried out or transferred to local government. At present, due to the privatisation of building certification, Council has only two building certifiers and therefore is not appropriately resourced to undertake this work. Taking into consideration the PI insurance matter and reduced private certification providers, State is investigating options of how this work can be undertaken and it is likely that Council may need to undertake these services in the future. At this time, Council has not received any building certification request or transfer of work to Council. So in the interim in 2021, a price and application fee for building certification works and services has been included in the register to cater for any potential increase in this work. When and if these applications are received, we will ensure a consistent approach for these fees. The recommendation presented to Council is to adopt these fees and charges for 2021 as listed. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Someone prepared to move. Councillor Dixon, thank you very much. Do I have a seconder, please? Councillor O'Pray, would you like to open, Councillor Dixon? Yes, good morning, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, we've talked a lot about fees and charges here today, and you know, when we talk about fees, it sounds quite scary. Uh, but really, the truth of the matter is, is that in development services, we're not really going to go out there to the industry and make life difficult. If you actually read through the document, most of our fees and charges are going up around 2%. It's quite modest. A lot of the fees are actually on hold at 0%. Uh, 
Um, and in terms of what we give back to, I guess, the border industry, our fees are actually quite um, much lower uh, in terms of the averages across uh, South East Queensland. If you look in the documents that have been provided to us, you'll see that there's a lot of councils in South East Queensland that are charging a lot more for development activity than Sunshine Coast Council. Whilst not the highest or the lowest, we are holding things quite average across the region. What is important, though, is to know what we're doing for residents. So, if you know about Development I, Development Services have put together a free online uh, portal, I would call, or protocol that actually lets you log in and um, look at developments across the region. You can find out what is proposed in your local community. You can see the impacts of that, the zoning of land and all the application details. In fact, I use it so much, I'm actually posting it on Facebook. So. I, if I get a development application in, I let my local residents know what's been applied for in the area. I link them to all the development documents and then they can give their feedback. And that's free. Um, that's a service that has cost council a lot of money to put together, but it's free for residents and it's free for the industry. Also, one thing that's very important for us is to give free pre-lodgement meetings for mums and dads. So you're a local business owner, you want to start up something new, you want to do a small development, we're going to give you those face-to-face -face interactions for free. You can come into the counter, talk to somebody, sit down, talk with a professional and get the help you need, get that advice from day one. But if you're in the industry and you're looking at doing significant development, we are going to charge you for that, but we will give you professional advice on the day. Looking at this, DA is a very complex um, area and probably from my point of view, this is the most streamlined report in terms of fees and charges that I've ever seen. It's very easy to read. We've also picked up on things that we weren't charging for before things that we may have been assessing and found out that there was a lot of work involved and there were no charges. So we're actually ratifying that and making sure that people can see you know, up front what they're going to get charged. From my point of view, very sympathetic, not only to residents, but also to the industry in this tough time. Um, being out and about as I do, I was talking to Avid Property Group at Palmview recently. I sat down and had a meeting with them and I said to Anthony and the team out there, uh, you know, it must be quite difficult at the moment not being able to sell lots with COVID-19 and their response was, we're actually selling more lots now than we did before. So in terms of residential market and land sales and purchase, um, the, the developers out there are still turning over a lot of land product, which is not only good for residents to get into their first and second home, but it's also good for council because in terms of fees and charges, we do get a lot of bulk earthworks, we do get a lot of bulk um, plan ceiling, which is our, our lots and community developments. We see a lot of those through our door and it's important for us to pick up on those fees and charges. Overall, uh, sympathetic to the region and to the development industry as much as we can right now. Thank you, Councillor Dixon. Any other speakers? Councillor Natali. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, Patricia, just a couple of questions here. You talked about legal fees being able to be recouped in terms of infrastructure charges. And we, we charge for all of the, and try and recoup the costs in terms of all of the way through until a, a DA is actually either approved or, or refused. What about the court costs? I mean, that, that's a, an associated aspect of and result of any decision that we make. Is it any way that we can actually recoup the costs of court fees that we have to go in and defend our, our decisions in court? When we go to court, at the um, end of a court proceeding, if, if the outcome is in favour of council, we can ask for um, expenses to be paid for council to recoup those costs. Um, however, because of the court cases, it's not known whether or not anyone is going to appeal and go to court with all outcomes. Um, it's an option that an applicant can actually go down or a submitter can go down. It's very difficult to actually recruit, recoup those costs. So there's no way that we can build that into the process where we... Is it an option? Or under law, we can't? Under law, the only way we can do it is via the process that I mentioned, which was at the end of the process. If we think that there is claims to request, we can ask though for those claims and the cost, cost recovery to be achieved at the end of the court proceedings. Just in regards to the building certification fees and the current crisis and the PI insurance, um, I, I can see that this is going to come back in council in terms of we used to have our own business units and we, they were dismantled when the government brought in private certifiers. It looks like we're going to revert back into that situation. Do you have a plan apart from knowing that we're probably more than likely going to end up down that path, but I mean, 
Do you actually have a plan in place of how we're going to manage that if it does happen? So at the moment, the plan is we actually haven't had any uptake really yet of those transferring of skills or coming to council to ask for the assessment functions. Um, at this stage, um, we'll be working with the two building certifiers we have already in council. Um, if and when those we get a more demand for that, we will be looking at a business case um, to be developed to look at what resourcing needs we might need to cover that. The, the point I'm making here is that what if the industry collapses? What if the insurance industry says that's it? Rather than sort of planning at that point, should we not have a plan in place now that sort of predicts a possibility that we may be forced into the market earlier? We may be in a situation where we have to have a plan ready to go. And is that something that, I, that you believe uh, council should actually have in place? We are working on it in the background at the moment. We're going through options. Um, we are reliant a lot upon the state government. The state government have got a working group in place investigating this, um, and they will be, be giving us feedback about what, what they think the avenues are for each council and the private building certifiers. So, One follow-up follow question. Just a, do we actually charge an inspection fee for water membrane, the, the installation of water membranes in multi-dwelling units? Do we actually have an inspection fee or do we actually inspect? Because that seems to be a common problem that, um, with multi-unit developments where inappropriate um, um, applications of the water membrane has resulted in significant damage to property down the track. And I think that could be mitigated by having a proper inspection process right at the beginning to make sure it's done properly. Um, and recently, I. I looked at a, a penthouse in Malulba, quite a substantial uh, development, and it's at the point of almost being condemned. That's how bad the application of the water membrane was. Uh, significant damage. Uh, so I, I know I've been on body corporates. I know it's always been a, a problem for body corporates, the water membrane, but I'm asking, is that one of the fees that we, inspection fees that we should have included and actually charge to make sure that that inspection is done thoroughly at the point of the development? Um, the fee section I mentioned before, which was section 7.1.2 and 7.2.2, operational works constructions, that relates to all the civil engineering works. So when an engineer will go out on site and look at those works to make sure they comply with the conditions of approval. So that does include um, a lot of the civil stuff that's on site. Okay. Any other speakers? Councillor Johnston. <coughs> Mr Mayor, I'm not wanting to speak, I'm wanting to ask a question. Um, I noticed in the, the comparison of the code accessible fees and charges uh, for the Sunshine Coast and the, uh, and the SEQ average, we have a very uh, commendable situation where our residential and granny flat approvals um, are substantially below uh, the industry average for um, South East Queensland. But in some other areas, we are incredibly um, higher. For instance, um, for a 1,000 square metre industrial, um, we're almost double the fees of the average for South East Queensland. And there are other cases where we are substantially above industry average. Uh, can you sort of explain to us why that is the case, please? So is that on page 154? You're looking at the three, four, five. Yep. Yep. I think the one I was so talking the... about was at the top of page 155. Okay. Um, so the industrial ones. Yep. So we have a, quite a different range of industrial uses. So I, um, I know a lot of the councils only probably have a couple of industrial uses. Um, so we did look in, into this a little bit to see, we'll investigate exactly um, where they got that figure from. Um, the issue here is though, you know, we did increase it quite significantly last financial, this financial year that we're in. Um, I don't know, we, we can dive into that a little bit more for next financial year, Councillor Johnston, if you want to. So. Thank you. 
Councillor Tully. Um, under the plumbing record search, based on the rest of the um, South East Queensland, it doesn't seem like our council um, offers any plumbing records. There's no, no graph there that indicate. Yeah. Why so, is that? So um, previously, we only offered a domestic category, and now we've opened up to a commercial category as well. So there was no fee before. Um, it probably should have said that the fee was the like of the previous one for domestic. So that's where, we, sorry, that comparison should have been shown. Okay, no, Councillor Hungerford. Mr Mayor, <clears throat> the development service register for cost recovery fees and commercial charges includes the relevant fees for development assessment, development information, development audit and compliance, as well as building and plumbing services. This covers quite a range of services Council provides. This year we've made a substantial improvement to this and I think this needs to be pointed out. For the 2021, we have combined and presented the two previous separate registers into a single register. And this makes it a lot easier for, for council staff and the, the industry to deal with. And I think we need, we need to, to, to acknowledge that. Being the Development Services Register for Cost Recovery Fees and Commercial Charges 2020-21. Now for the 20. 2021 revenue projection for the Development Services Register is expected to be approximately $19 million. But as we've noted, because of the impacts of COVID-19, building activity may decline during the 2021 year. So this revenue may be impacted and something we have to be focused on as we go through the year in our, in our overlying budget deliberations and our quarterly reports. But I put this forward. It has been very thoroughly looked at. We all went through it. I think it's very balanced and fair in this environment and I commend it to you to su support this today. Thank you, Councillor Hungerford. If there are no further speakers, I'm going to go to Councillor Dixon to close. No need to close. Councillors will put the motion to the vote. Those in favour? It's carried unanimously. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, we're going to move to item 4.7, which is the application of national competition policy 2020-21, and I'm inviting Simon Croc and Paul Skillon to give us a presentation. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The purpose of this report is to make recommendations on the application of nas national competition policy reforms for 2021 financial year. So if we could go to the first slide, please. So, this presentation runs you through a brief overview of national competition policy, how national competition and policy is applied to Council's business activities, the identification and reform options, um, the process we go through every year, what's involved in the budget process for NCP, and how we apply um, competitive neutrality, how we achieve competitive neutrality. Thank you. So national competition policy um, started off in the mid-1990s. It was an agreement by all tiers of Australian governments to increase competition and try and increase the uh, resuce, efficient use of resources. So for local governments in Queensland um, from 1996 that applied or extended the trade practices laws uh, prohibiting any competitive activities. It introduced the competitive neutrality so that private businesses could compete on an equal footing with those owned by a local government. Also brought in review and reform um, of all laws that restrict competition and specific reforms and price monitoring for the water, water industry. So for Council, um, how we apply national competition policy, we have a policy framework so we can ensure compliance with the legislative requirements. 
Each year we look at what activities we're undertaking and identify which of those are business activities and which, what's the appropriate reform option to apply to that business. The budget process has a series of uh, measures in it um, and I'll step you through some of those. We also, um, there's disclosure in the annual report specifically on council's business activities. Uh, the Queensland Audit Office, their compliance and financial statement audit uh, looks at these, these items. And finally, we have a competitive, competitive neutrality complaints process. So if there's any businesses out there that um, don't like the way we do things, they can make a complaint and that can be investigated. So as part of the annual review, we've identified councils as three business activities at the moment. The significant business activity is our waste and resources management activity, and we apply the full cost pricing reform to that. Sunshine Coast holiday parks and quarries um, have been identified as business activities, and we apply the code of competitive conduct reform to those two. We've looked at the roads business or roads activities and determined that is not a business activity as we don't go into competition with anybody. So moving now to the budget process. So for the activities, we look at their revenue requirements from long-term financial models and full cost pricing models. We use activity-based costing at the product and service level to inform those pricing models. We develop an overarching pricing strategy to, based on the level of cost recovery. And then I think recently, councillors, the business activities have presented those to you as part of the budget process, I think, earlier in May. Um, so regarding their pricing strategies to achieve full cost recovery. So once they're approved, that then flows into the fees and charges and the utility charges for the waste business. So moving now to how do we achieve competitive neutrality? So basically in simple terms, uh, competitive neutrality is, means that on average prices should be set to recover all the relevant costs of supplying that product or service. And also, that total revenue of the business activity should equal the sum of efficient operating expenses, including competitive neutrality adjustments, a return of capital or depreciation, and a return on capital. Thank you. So having a, looking a bit deeper at what are efficient operating expenses and competitive neutrality adjustments. So direct materials and labour, for example, they make up the bulk of operating expenses, consumables, things like superannuation costs. Then there's all the indirect costs, such as finance, the procurement services, human resources, digital information systems services, so forth. And of course, the management overheads as well. On the competitive neutrality adjustment side, because uh, council enjoys certain benefits, such as we don't pay income tax to the federal government or land tax to the state government on, on some properties, we need to adjust, make adjustments for those in the business activities. So add them back in to the cost base. Other advantages and disadvantages of being a local government owned business also need to be removed. So for example, the council can borrow funds from the Queensland Treasury Corporation and make benefit from the state's AAA credit rating to get a very low cost of debt. We, unwant, we put a debt margin on top of that for the business activities to, comparable to that what the private sector must pay. 
And, and the last one there is community service obligations. So, for example, the waste business goes round and picks up all the public, public place bins. A, a private operator wouldn't necessarily do that out of the goodness of their own heart. They would demand a, a fee for it. So we give a revenue to the waste business for that, for that service. And that way the, the business activities should be competing on the same basis as the private sector. The last item I'll just cover briefly is the return on capital and the weighted average cost of capital. So essentially the return on capital is the actual and opportunity cost of the one investment over another. It's the cost of the business activities capital and it incorporates return on debt and also the cost of equity. Now, providers of capital take on different risks, so they command different returns. And generally, debt holders have a contractual right, um, whereas equity holders only have a residual right. So debt, holders, debt is often cheaper than, than equity. Moving now to the weighted average cost of capital. So we use a methodology um, that's consistent with the approach adopted by Australian industry regulators for regulatory pricing purposes. It incorporates a classical cost of capital formula, adjusted for dividend invitation, it uses a capital asset pricing model, uh, and, and that facilitates comparability to market returns. It excludes the effect of financing, uh, financing arrangements for the particular business and looks at what happens in the, that industry. And it also enables the calculation of cash flows for operational segments. So that's how we can do it for the waste business, the holiday parks and the quarries separately. So I recommended the report to you and the, re the recommendation is set out there that um, you receive and note the report, Application National Competition Policy for 2021, and that we apply the full cost pricing reform to the waste business, waste and resources management, significant business activity, in accordance with Section 441B of the Local Government Act, and that we apply the Code of Competitive Conduct to the Sunshine Coast holiday parks and the quarries, business activities, in accordance with section 47 of the Local Government Act. Thank you, Simon. <clears throat> Someone to move? Councillor Natoli, thank you. Is there a seconder? Councillor Johnston, thank you. Would you like to open, Councillor Natoli? Thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you, Simon, for your presentation. I was in council when the national competition policy came into effect and to be honest, at that stage, our caravan parks were run as if they were a, an extended service of local government. And I can remember that if someone booked for a week, it didn't matter whether it was a low uh, shoulder or peak season, we still gave them a discount of two days if they booked for a week. And, um, and it was an inc incredible transition. And I think it's been a, a really positive way of being able to understand the businesses making sure how they reflect and the impact on, on existing businesses um, that we as a council have grown and understood that running businesses are actually a serious activity and need to be treated like every other business, whether you're a private in the private sector or the public sector. And the framework that the national competition policy has brought in allows us to actually do that in a very constructive way. So I think it's been a positive outcome for us. Um, I, I suppose in some cases, really question in particular, understanding what the impacts of those businesses are. Now, if council undertakes, and we talk about here whether the, the introduction of Brisbane Road car park becomes a business activity, and of course the threshold um, that we talk in this particular um, document here is that it has an expenditure of over 347,000 
um, as being the threshold of considering whether it becomes a business activity. And then the question is whether it's just off street or whether it actually has, you know, whether it incorporates if we do go down that path or whether it actually incorporates all on street parking as well, whether we actually create a business unit that undertakes per se called car parking and whether all of that and whether the expenditure then is all the fees and charges, um, you know, uh, whether our offices that go out and regulate that are all part of the expenditure. So there's a question that I'd like to be answered when, when I finish. Um, because I think it's, it's also interesting to see that when we go through this process of developing uh, the competitive neutrality aspect of the, under national competition policy, of whether we then start to look at, if we do go down the path of introducing paid car park, and Brisbane Road is the first of what could be many um, multi-deck car parks, where the Sunshine Plaza then becomes the natural competitor, because that's the only other major um, source of competition that I can see and whether we then have to relate to the way that they compete in terms of how many hours free that they give and the charges, fees and charges that they, they apply to their, to their customers as well. So I'd be interested to understand how we actually develop through that process of, of understanding whether it is a business activity and how it then translates into the whole framework under national co competition policy and who our competitors are and how we make sure that we are not positioning ourselves. The other aspect to this is also understanding that if we do go down and, and make it a business, how it impacts on the actual businesses we're imposed. And I don't think national competition policy sort of goes and delves into that aspect of the businesses where we impose <coughs> um, pay car parking, whether the whether we understand the true impacts on those businesses and whether we, we are creating um, uh, a barrier for them to do business in terms of other major shopping centres like Kiwana that don't offer pay car parking. So that, that, that whole overarching competitiveness in terms of the industry by bringing in a business unit and trying to understand that it needs to compete did you have a question you wanted to get to? I'm, I'm building on that, Mr. Well, Baron. Well, uh, I'm, I'm observing that you're really speaking to the, the motion right. rather than asking a question. So sure. I'd just like to distinguish between the two. So, um, so I'm, that's the question in terms of where does that take the whole process of, of evaluating the competitiveness of a particular area that has our business unit imposing fees and charges uh, compared to areas that don't have fees and charges. Thank you for that question. I think the answer to that comes in the process for when a new business activity is identified, we have to undertake a um, public benefits test and that will look into all those, uh, all those matters about which market we're competing in, who, who are the other participants, what the impact of our entry into that market would be, and um, a whole range of process, a whole series of community and stakeholder consultation that's involved in that. So that um, is the process the, the legislation sets out, and that's one that we'll, we'll need to undertake if we head down that path. So just a continuation on that question. So do we do that before? we actually impose the business and start the business and understanding what those impacts are before we actually make a decision to actually undertake that business. The, uh, you can enter the business. The way you apply national competition policy reforms to the business is informed by the public benefits test. So it's you need to get the policy and the business structure in place first, and then you apply, okay, now you have a business, you've identified who your com competition is, um, the public benefits test will make a recommendation on, on which reform option to apply. Any other speakers? Councillor Suarez? Mr Mayor, 
Um, Simon, I'm just wondering why music festivals aren't identified in, um, as a business and then have the national competition policy applied to it? Okay. The, when national competition policy first came in, uh, a lot of local governments and um, the former councils of the Sunshine Coast um, also, also were very keen on applying it to everything like libraries, aquatic centres and a range of um, activities that ultimately didn't prove to be business activities. And we tend to put the music festivals into that category. There's as much, you know, community, um, community benefit focus and economic, de uh, de you know, development attraction of, um, of tourists and everything to the Sunshine Coast. There's, that is a big focus of the, the music festivals rather than the, the business activity itself. So we've treated them in that light. Just um, further on that point, I understand when you're hosting events that there may be some events, for example, arts events or environmental events that don't really return an economic uh, profit and are not really undertaken by the private sector to do so. But music events seem to be um, an outlier. So there's a lot of private companies who do host music events and host them and make a profit. Yet we seem to be hosting music events which are in competition with the private sector um, but we're not really expecting to make profits on those. And yes, we get the economic development uh, benefits from them, um, but I'm just wondering why we're competing with the private sector in one hand, but we're not applying the national competition policy to that activity when the private sector are making profits on them. Yeah, I guess the answer is, is that we don't identify it as a business activity. We identify that activity's prime function is to promote, you know, community um, benefits and economic benefits, rather uh, than and I think a business the, activity. Simon, that becomes a policy issue for council. Um, and again, I think if you look at the history of some of the events you're perhaps referring to, um, there was no one doing them when some of those events started. The community was crying out for opportunity and council filled the void that wasn't being filled by anybody else. Um, if that's to be changed, that's a matter for council to determine. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily something that Simon's going to be able to add any more to, uh, given that was the decision that was taken by council, that they weren't considered businesses more so community events. Um, so, Mr Mayor, in light of that um, response, and, and I understand that, that at the time those events um, brought a lot of people to the Sunshine Coast and created us as a destination that's suitable to have those types of events, would um, it be prudent for Council to review this in the future uh, to see whether or not some of those events should actually apply underneath the national competition policy? That, that's a matter for us to make a decision on, absolutely. Thank you. Councillor Hungerford. <clears throat> Probably an attempt to clarify our national competition a bit better. The national competition policy reforms are applied to various identified business activities of the Council. Competitive neutrality aims to promote efficient competition between Council businesses and private sector businesses. Specifically, the application of a competitive neutrality seeks to ensure that Council's business activities do not enjoy competitive advantages over private um, competitors simply by virtue of their public sector ownership. And there's a very distinct difference here. The fundamental part of competitive neutrality is full cost pricing. Full cost pricing in simple terms means that on average, prices should fully recover all the relevant costs of supplying a product or service and total revenue received by the business. So on that basis, it is recommended in the 2021 business activity structure based on the annual business activity review and identification conducted in accordance with the legislation is to 
apply the full cost pricing in accordance with section 44.1b of the Local Government Act 2009 <laughs> to the waste and resource management significant business activity and apply the code of competitive conduct to the Sunshine Coast holiday parks and quarries business activities in accordance with sections 47 of the Local Government Act 2009. Now, if this recommend this recommendation needs to be adopted each financial year as per, per legislative requirements. We have to do this on an annual basis. And it has been noted, should the recommendation be accepted by Council, it is noticed that the Chief Executive Officer will continue to apply the competition poli policy reforms for 2021 financial year, as the recommended business activity structure for 2021 is the same as the activity structure currently in place. There are no significant changes in process required. We have a very sound national competition policy in place. There are no significant changes. This is just business as usual. But as was brought up before, anything else can be looked at to see whether it fits into that category. And uh, we can adjust that through the year. But councillors, I put this to you. We're doing, it, it's very sound and competent what we're doing. This is a continuation, continuation on those business units and um, there's no significant changes in the process for this financial year. So it shows we are, have a sound process in place, but we can always look at other things if we think they apply. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hungerford. No further speakers. Can I go back to Councillor Natoli to close? No need to close. Put the motion to the vote. Those in favour? That's carried unanimously. Thank you, Councillors. Thank you, Simon. And the final item is 4.8, the procurement policy and procurement and contracting framework. And I invite Paul Skillen for the presentation. Thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, councillors, and good morning. Uh, the purpose of the presentation today is to have council consider and adopt a procurement policy and procurement framework or procurement and contracting framework for our local government. Um, the policy uh, consists of a procurement policy, uh, it's directed that we have one of these by the Local Government Act and the regulations. In fact, the regulations direct the entirety of the frameworks that we are able to operate in. And within those frameworks, we choose and now putting to you the, the mechanisms that we will use to pursue the contracts for the provision of goods and services and for the disposal of valuable non-current assets. The framework in the form that we have, um, which is from the strategic contracting procedures side of the options that we have, which consist of the procurement policy, the contract manual, a contract plan, significant contract plans being adopted when uh, a contract worth more than $5 million is identified. Uh, they haven't been identified yet given the position we are with the budget. They would come back on an individual or group basis following adoption of the budget. Uh, and then some supporting guidelines. Uh, in terms of the procurement and therefore the purchase of our <coughs> excuse me, goods and services, we would have uh, or are proposing that um, the framework includes from zero to $25,000 contracts being by one quote, that's consistent with last year, 25,000 to 250,000 being three quotes, 250 to a million being either by a five quote process or by open tender or supplier arrangement, from a million to five million is uh, a tender or supplier arrangement, and for contracts worth $5 million or more, that would again be through a tender supplier arrangement, but would also require the adoption of a significant contracting plan. There are examples of significant contracting plans of needing to come back to council prior to entering into a contract for one of the larger ones we would have. The contracting manual what outlines very specifically how we will actually go about this process. So it creates our, the mechanisms for the probity environment, it creates our governance and the mechanisms for considering how we approach the market, the framework in which we approach the market, how and what we will evaluate as being meaningful to the council in determining um, the value to us in the contract or the submission that's been made. 
Similarly, for disposal activities, that's where we would be selling either or disposing of land, um, plant and equipment or other equipment worth a value of more than $10,000. In the main, that is generally land that we would be talking about, although there are occasions where we do dispose of some of our larger yellow kit when it gets, or yellow plant when it gets towards the end of um, its useful life for council. Uh, then in the contracting plan, it considers the markets that we will be engaging with and guides us towards the significant contracting plans that we would come back here for. We have a number of supporting guidelines that uh, also inform the various policy decisions that, that this council has previously adopted. There's four of them that are, are being considered and put to you for this year. The first and most primary is our local preference in procurement guideline. That guideline was implemented to ensure um, and pursue a positive engagement with our competitive local business and industry. Uh, there are some changes that um, will I hopefully or expect to drive a greater degree of engagement, which I'll put to you shortly. Uh, just by way of statistics, so to the end of um, May for this year, we've had a procurement spend, so this is our goods and services of 343 million of that. So we're doing about $30 million on average a month, 30 to 31. Um, that leaves us having spent 240 presently, or about 70% with local suppliers. Uh, doesn't include the airport, and I've got some statistics on that standing alone at the, for you shortly. Uh, for, for the month of April, uh, we did 29 million and of that 23 million was with local suppliers. So that is about 76% for, for the month of April. The framework on the left is what I put to you before of the zero to 25 and the like, the framework in which we would invite quotes. What now lays beside that um, for you to consider is the framework that we used for local preference engagement for the current year and then the one we are proposing to use for, uh, sorry, for the current year and then the one we're proposing to use for the coming year. So, so both this year and for the coming year, if adopted, all quotes should be sought for zero to $25,000 from local contractors. Um, for 25 to 250, it was previously two of the three quotes should have been from locals. We're now heading towards uh, suggesting three of three. For the 250 to 1 million, it was three of five. We're now moving towards preferably all, but a minimum of four to five. And what I'm hoping you can see is as the greater the contract value is, the more that uh, we need to ensure the competitive nature of uh, the industry that we're engaging with. And while we're looking to always engage with that competitive local industry, the higher it gets, the more we would need to at least ensure that that competitiveness is tested by um, the ability to consider um, submissions from outside while still driving towards a fundamental leadership of engaging locals. For contracts worth more than a million where we are required to do a tender, that's an open tender. We can't dictate who responds to that. It is meant to be open to attract um, responses from wider than necessarily just the area. Um, in the past, we have applied a 15% weighting in favour of the local preference. We're proposing to include increase that to 20. That 20 is apportioned, as was the 15, across the ability to uh, exi having existed in the local area. So that's our offices within our local area and an employment base, but also extends into considering um, that entity's engagement with um, social benefit uh, and community um, organisations also. Uh, the next guideline uh, is less used than this, but still in increasing, and that's our social benefit and procurement guideline. It's uh, in support of our the Sunshine Coast social strategy. So it seeks to engage with social benefit providers uh, and in industries that uh, can subcontract with social benefit providers. Two examples um, of social benefit engagement that I've given there are the, uh, the event management of the carols at um, Cotton Tree. Uh, and, and also at Kings Beach, and then uh, some social benefit engagement with uh, resource recovery centre operations. 
Our First Nation procurement guideline uh, is the next one to speak of. It is in pursuit of our um, reconcilia reconciliation action plan. Uh, that plan is due to be adopted or a new plan put to you shortly. Uh, both this guideline in its current form supports the existing wrap and will also support uh, any future wrap. As you can see, we're on the way on a decline at the moment with the engagement of the, the values, but because of our, our airport project and the need to engage with uh, some of our First Nation groups during the course of that project, we actually had some very significant spend with them where were it not for that project, we wouldn't have. So prior to the implementation of this guideline, we had a spend in, in a year, which for the 16, 17 year was um, less or about $100,000. We're up, as you can see, up to 547, and then um, 250 for the, uh, sorry, 522 for next year. We're on the way down at the moment because of the ending of that project, but we're still nonetheless looking for opportunities to engage with our First Nations businesses. The final one uh, is a, a called an innovation and market-led engagement guideline. There are occasions where uh, entities approach us with uh, either a very innovative solution that is that unique that we can't quite find someone to competitively respond to it other than that, in other than that entity. Similarly, the state government has a framework for market-led engagements where a single entity would approach the organisation. Traditionally, we have had to take the view, because it involves the engagement of um, a contractor to provide goods or services, that we would have to take, say, that's a fantastic idea, now we're going to have to do a, a tender for it. Um, this market-led proposal gives us a a very strict framework through which we could, uh, were it not for, for this guideline, we, we previously would not been, have been able to, but for this guideline can, through a very strict process, consider a market-led engagement. Now, we only introduced it last year and it hasn't been used yet, yet but I would put it to you that it is valuable nonetheless. Uh, it involves coming to this forum in order to consider a market-led proposal. It's not just you will, you'll get it and hear about it later. We would need to bring it here. But it is, in my view, a useful mechanism to be kept in the cupboard for the uh, occasion when a very unique proposal uh, comes to Council. Uh, up there is a series of our supplier arrangements. We have about 30 of them at the moment. Those supplier arrangements are formed by tender. Uh, meaning that we don't stop outsiders applying to be on them. But as you can see, nonetheless, through the application of the 15% local spend weighting and the maturity of the businesses on the Sunshine Coast, that we have a very significant number of local providers represented on them. The result of the report and all of the material in front of you is to seek a recommendation to have the procurement policy adopted and the procurement and contracting framework for the year 2020-21. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Some are prepared to move. <coughs> Councillor Hungerford, thank you. Seconder. Councillor Suarez, thank you. Would you like to open? Councillor Hungerford. Through you, Mr Mayor. The Local Government Act 2009 and the Local Government Regulation 2012, the regulation outline the procurement and contracting frameworks through which councils must conduct procurement of goods and services and disposal of non-current assets. The regulations work, require councils' procurement and contracting framework to be reviewed and adopted on an annual basis. Now, take, take note here, the proposed procurement and contracting framework complies with all legislative obligations. It takes into consideration internal, external and investigative body audits. The recommendations provide an appropriate framework for conducting effective and efficient contracting activities. Now, I'd like to point out in our preference here, the local preference in procurement guideline has been su subjected to detailed review in light of COVID-19 pandemic and its profound impact on the businesses and our community. The guideline proposed has been designed to support local businesses 
recovery and provide further economic stimulus opportunity to businesses from council. Now, when you look at ours, the current local preference and procurement guideline in Appendix C has guided council's preference for engaging with local suppliers. This has resulted in council spending more than 213 million with local suppliers for the current financial year to the 1st of May 2020, which represents 69.5% of the available procurement spend. This is up from 200 million at the same time last financial year. The local preference and procurement guideline has been subject to detailed review in light of the COVID-19 pandemic and has profound impact on businesses and this community. The guideline proposed has been designed to support local business recovery and provide further economic stimulus opportunity from council to our local businesses. And I think that's the big point I want to make here is this council is backing our businesses and our community as we come out of the um, COVID-19 pandemic. And I think that it needs to be pointed out that council is so focused on helping our businesses and our community get through this. And we're doing, endeavouring to do this with all of these policies and the budget that we're bringing down in two weeks' time. And I commend this to you in the light of a very positive um, look at our community and how much this council is working to support this community. Thank you, Councillor Hungerford. Councillor O'Pray. And uh, through you, um, Mr Skillen, this is, this is important stuff. This is really, really important detail for our community. And um, Ted's hit the nail on the head saying there's around about $200 million already gone into our community about this. Um, you need to be congratulated for getting this together so, so um, prudently. Um, my question is around um, the difference between uh, going for quotes and going for tenders. Now, if we can pull up page six um, of the... Uh, local preferences in procurement guideline. I've just got a quick question there in regard to the 250 to 100 million, uh, sorry, $1 million uh, tender or quote process. Have we got it there, Maddie? While that's coming up, I'm just interested to know um, how do we make the call? How does council make the decision of whether we go for one or the other. So if we've got, for example, a $750,000 job, which we do lots of, I think there were 63 um, jobs in that bracket over the last 12 months. So let's do a standard, stock standard $650,000, $700,000 project. How do we make the call whether we go to the quote process of five quotes or we put it out to tender? And the reason I ask this question because I think there's a big difference for a lot of those small businesses, those mum and dad businesses out there that need to fork out a lot more money for one versus the other. So I'm just interested in how we make the decision on whether we go to five quotes or we put it out to ten. Uh, through the chair, uh, Councillor, last year was the first year that that 250 to one million dollar threshold for quoting was introduced. Prior to last year, it had been above 250 had to be a tender. So it was introduced on the basis of us moving to the strategic contracting procedures, considering the depth of the market that we had. Um, the, the guidelines actually intended to guide using the quoting process first above tendering or before tendering for that value there. So the, the, the preference is to lean in favour of tendering where we decide who we invite. Then you apply the guideline to say we've decided we'll invite and now we'll invite locals. Uh, if th there is the latitude to consider that if the market, because of that particular piece of work, so it's not just the fact that it's a $750,000 piece, but because of the very unique nature of a piece of work, that you would consider that the local um, industry maybe isn't big enough, wide enough or deep enough to sustain it, and in which case you would then lean towards tender noting that the locals could still apply and if it was a tender, they will still be able to enjoy the 20% um, local preference evaluation there. Priority, priority to summarise, priority is prefer RFQing, the request for quote rather than tender, noting that I don't think we should eliminate it as an option. Then on the occasions which should be few that it does occur, we have that 20% preference anyway. Thank you, Councillor O'Pray. Councillor Natoli. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, 
it's pleasing to know that the weighting is going up from 15 to 20 per cent, and I would hope that we can continue to increase that weighting in years to come. Just in regards to, you mentioned, Mr Skillen, that, um, that as part of that local, it's, when we start to talk about some of these large contracts, um, and more than likely we'll talk about the, our waste and, and maybe telecommunication, where we've got national companies more than likely are going to be the, the ones that are going to win these tenders. Um, how much weight in them do we put on the fact that how many locals do they actually employ? Because that's a really important component, whether they do have a, a, a big local base or not, I think would be a significant part. Do you build that into the actual tender process? Through the chair, a firm answer of yes. Uh, there's been, and I might use the airport expansion project D&C contract as an example. We were aware of the fact there wasn't likely to be in that instance the ability for a single contractor from the Sunshine Coast to deliver that project. So the structure of that tender was created to say we'll acknowledge that, now tell us how in winning that contract if you do, you will engage and subcontract to as many locals as you can. We then applied that, I'll continue using that example, to monitor with uh, John Holland delivering the runway the percentage of spend that they have in the single contract we have them with them with locals. And I'd mentioned it actually before that, that I would get to that. I can tell you from the John Holland as an example, they're almost at 60% of the total contract value spend that they have going to identified locals within um, our local government area. So it's a procurement decision in, in establishing the tender on asking the question, are you a local or not, move to the next phase down if you aren't, or even if you are, what local contracting can you do in order to deliver the single contract that you are being awarded? And does that continue on with the workforce? Like if we we're asking them for a percentage of their workforce, that would be based here on the Sunshine Coast. So um, to me, I think that's an important aspect, especially if it's a major national company that is winning a tender. I think if we're going to get the local component, I want to know that we're going to be supporting a company that has a large component of their workforce actually based here on the Sunshine Coast compared to a company that might only have a small component. Uh, through the chair, uh, if I use another example where that has actually happened is some large consultancies have um, offices in every major city in Australia and small offices here on the Sunshine Coast. They will attempt to claim to be local because their five people here on the Sunshine Coast are working from a Sunshine Coast office. And in my view, they're entitled to some consideration for that. But that requires us to then look at the work that they're doing. And if it's not those five doing that work, then they shouldn't enjoy um, that, de that degree of where well, we're a local and we're here. And that doesn't go down well with them sometimes, but that's the, the approach we take it. We are looking for uh, the locals in, in employment doing the work just as much as we're looking for the local business too. Just follow up questions. I'm very interested in trying to understand the procurement team and the process of managing every contract. You talked about a weighting of local being 20%, and obviously there's different weighting components for a whole range of skill sets that they have. Is that the same weighting for every contract, or does that vary? Because I know in the past um, it's been um, possibly designed to, to, that it could be designed to support a particular company that it may favour, and I just want to know whether you have that that capability of doing that, or can you circumvent that by having a standard set of weighting for every contract that goes out? And the other question to follow up that as well is the renewal of personnel that sit on the procurement um, panel. It's, uh, it's important that we have confidence that it constantly renews so that we don't have people that sit on those procurement panels um, forever and a day, and knowing that you know, probity issues are major issues with any procurement process that we go through and having that confidence and knowing that there is that freshness renewal happening where uh, we, we mitigate, I suppose, the, the, the possibility of preferential treatment. Chair, to, to those two questions, uh, in terms of the percentage weightings, 
it's important and what does occur is that uh, it's confirmed that the 15% currently, expected to be 20 if it's adopted, is a um, fixed weighting, meaning it will not be removed. We don't want to give anyone the opportunity not to favour those locals. Over the remaining 80%, it's important to consider the particular procurement that's being undertaken it's, it, because it's to acquire a particular good or service or works to be conducted. So over that remaining 80%, there's consideration across a host of other criteria, price being one, capability and experience of the contractors, the methodology that they submit in order to undertake the work, uh, work health and safety, uh, depending on what it could be, we could also go into uh, environment and sustainability. So the remaining 80 is apportioned across that, having regard to the work that's sought to be done and the industry that we're engaging with. And to give you a, a very simplistic example, if it's easily found, then the percentage weighting for price would naturally go up. And the reason for that is you will then drive it towards a better value for money because it can be easily found. If it's something that's unique where we're going to be engaging with uh, a market that we haven't traditionally or it's going to be hard or complex work, then you need to be, in my view, prepared to acknowledge that you will have to pay more to get better. So then you would wind the, um, the percentage of the, the um, value for money portion, uh, sorry, not the value money, the price down to ensure that you accept and don't exclude a competent respondent who has um, valued the work appropriately and brings a high degree of skills to, to it. Similarly, with the methodology and capability and experience, the more complex the work, the more you want the history of that company to align with the ability to have done it. Uh, and then, of course, if you've got work health and safety, which depending on the, the risk associated with it, you would wind that up as well. So it's an apportionment across there, having regard to the work and what needs to be undertaken. In terms of establishing <coughs> excuse me, um, evaluation committees, we have a team of um, seven procurement specialists who lead the larger tenders. So they are, they are conducting about 100 tenders a year uh, and they lead the process for doing that. The evaluation team is put together uh, through a combination of one procurement specialist, the contract administrator from the area that is going to live with the contract. If it's a, if it's a capital contract, it's likely to be um, our project delivery team. And then at the very least, someone from another team, not within those two branches, to give that um, some independence. And then on occasions we have second tiers that don't actually, let's say, vote or contribute to the scoring but they bring their particular skill sets to informing on particular parts of the tender. And an example of that is our work health and safety team. We might bring in, in the second tier, a work health and safety um, professional in order to evaluate the work health and safety submissions and provide to the evaluation committee um, detailed information about the substance of that part of the submission. So I'm comfortable that, that both the framework for establishing um, that leaves us with a continual flow and change in evaluation committees to overcome the very exact point that you made about just having the same old group getting together to therefore at least have the perception that there could be some favouritism in any particular direction. It's almost impossible to achieve. And just one final follow-up question. After all that great work, mm -hmm. has there ever been an example where maybe the CEO has overridden the the decision of the actual procurement team? Uh, through the chair, uh, not that I can think of, but I'd take it on notice to have a look. Uh, and it, it, not, I can, I can say not, you will go to number two. It, 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 once it, if, if it's a matter that goes to the CEO or is coming to this forum, it's not a matter of saying, here, you evaluate it and decide. It's coming to you to say, this is who the evaluation recommends and you're either supporting that or you're not. To let anything else happen is actually to let that forum, either this forum or the CEO, conduct an evaluation that they actually haven't been part of. Thank you. Councillor Babarowski. Um, if I may, if, 
notwithstanding that that was a very important um, uh, discussion and debate around local procurement, I wouldn't mind just shifting the focus a little on to a relatively new part of the uh, procurement framework, which is the Innovation and Market-Led Engagement Guideline, which I think is incredibly comprehensive, and I commend uh, the team for producing that. Uh, I thought it might be useful for the community to just get their, uh, their understanding around this. It's, it's a really, uh, I think, useful mechanism, or hopefully will be. Um, but I just wanted to ask the question, uh, Mr Gillen, do other councils uh, use a mechanism like this? We know the state government does. Uh, presumably the federal government may do. But are there sizable councils that already use this mechanism? And could you give an example of the sort of uh, submission or proposal that might come through if there, if there are some examples? Yeah. Or are we so innovative that we're leading? <laughs> uh, through the chair. Thank you. Um, I'm not aware of another local government having it. Local, uh, the procurement framework within the, the regulations is set up in two parts. You have to choose. You either have the strategic contracting procedures, which this is part of, or you have the default principles. Now, there's only three and maybe four now councils in Queensland that have taken the decision to have the strategic adopted. Uh, that's Brisbane, the Gold Coast, ourselves, and I believe Redlands will be moving to it very shortly. So it's only those councils that could have something like this. An example of whether, of how, sorry, it could be used is, um, say, a community entity coming to us with a very good proposal on not only um, providing some community benefit through the services that they provide, but also entering into, I'm, I'm just picking things, say, let's say some sporting or just general community benefit as well. But they would have come to us and say, um, we've, can do, we can do this, but we need some support in doing that. Now, that might be we consider um, whether we would uh, allow them to build on a, a piece of our land. Now, now land's a valuable non-current asset and it, its disposal can't immediately be used um, through that process. But nonetheless, if we were to retain ownership, there could be a partnership, let's imagine, put to us where an entity said, um, we will build or develop this for you on your land. We can't afford the land and this, but if we were to partner together, we could, and there will be a community benefit of this resulting from it. Now, in the past, we, without that, we would have to go, that's a fantastic idea. We'll put out a tender and we'll see um, whether we dispose of the land, whether you can buy it or not, and then whether you can have enough money to do it. So I, I stress it's very uniquely used. You know, if we're coming here to use it um, once a year, I would be surprised. But it came about through some engagement with our economic development team who um, are friends of procurement, but who naturally have attention with wanting to advance locals and the like a little bit more than what our frameworks allow for. The, the framework that we adopted is basically to state, take the state's um, market-led proposal guideline and rather than say to the minister, brought it to, to the council. So we have a framework that's been tested at that higher level despite the fact that no other local governments used it, nor have we had the opportunity to yet. Councillor Law. <coughs> Through you. Uh, firstly, thank you for the work that must have been done to increase that local procurement to 76%. I think that's fantastic. Um, considering all of the procurement policies there, uh, can you give some uh, advice around, uh, if you're considering a First Nations or the social benefit, can that overlap with the local procurement as well? And those organisations may be able to take advantage of more than one of the policies. Uh, through the chair, uh, overlap as well. You can have the 20% for local and then um, a percentage um, separately apportioned to uh, a First Nation uh, business or a, a social benefit business if that's the market that we believe could respond to that. So they can certainly overlap. Um, dealing with a, the First Nation businesses, we're mindful, and you, you might have noted that there was some sole supplier applications, uh, some sole supplier referencing there. That's a single engagement contract where we're seeking to have 
um, some local, uh, some First Nation support or contracting. Um, there's, there's two First Nation peoples recognised within the area that we occupy, as I'm sure you know, and that at the airport it was a Kabi Kabi engagement. So we weren't going to use any other First Nation than that. So that was an example where we went through a, a more single quoting process, regardless of the value that there was. But the, sh the short answer is, if they were a local and a First Nation business, they can enjoy the, into the totality of the 20 and whatever is apportioned to the First Nation um, preference. OK, no further speakers. We'll go back to Councillor Hungerford to close. Mr Mayor, I put this uh, procurement policy forward for Council to support as we look to supporting this community as we go into the difficult year ahead and, um, and, and help to, particularly for our local contractors and community, to keep functioning through these difficult times. And I think it's a substantial um, effort that we're doing here and um, we, we should be congratulated for doing this. And um, I certainly hope we get to this time next year in a lot better climate uh, than we are after COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. We'll put the motion to the vote. All those in favour? That's carried unanimously. Thank you, councillors. That uh, brings our meeting to a close. Um, the, uh, the next meeting is down for the 26th, 5th, 26th. Um, so thank you, and thank you to those who joined us uh, via live streaming.